and then I'll take you through the agenda and how we will run the session. Thanks, Bex. Ko te kawa oronga, ko te kawa oraro, ko te kawa ora, ko te kawa ora. E ronga i whaka ire, oops, ire here, ki a ronga, tura tura o fiti, whaka moa, ki a tina, tina, huie, tai kia. Kia ora, Bex. So, um, just a quick run through of our agenda this evening. Um, what we are going to do is have a presentation from our CEO of the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab, Francis Ballantyne, all around this topic of the future of education. And then we're going to go into a panel discussion. So we've got with us this evening, Nick Kennedy from uh, Flux Federation. She's our C CEO there and also on our Mind Lab board, Kia ora, Nick. We also have Richard Wells, who's the Deputy Principal at Orewa College, and he's also a graduate of ours on the Digital and Collaborative Learning and a current student on our Master of Contemporary Education. Uh, and then we also have Lucas and Arlen, who are students um, at Dilworth, and also they've been a part of our Hey Future program as well. So kia ora to all of you, and we look forward to the panel that uh, Francis is going to run with you this evening. And then lastly, what we'll do is we'll open it up to the floor uh, to ask questions that may come in for our panelists. Um, and then we've got a couple of wrap up slides um, in the uh, towards the end, which is a little bit more about the Mind Lab programs if you're interested in them. Um, but without further ado, we will kick into this evening's session. So some familiar faces you may see um, this evening. I myself, um, I'm Fee Webby. Um, I'm the general manager at the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab. And I have a baby arriving in the ish, three-ish weeks. Um, and so Monique Pearson is our general manager who's going to step in for me while I'm off on maternity leave for approximately six or so months. So uh, we'll just get Monique to wave your hands and say kia ora. Kia ora everyone. Who you are, thank you. Um, and we also have Lisa Whittington Slater. Now Lisa is our outreach manager across our digital and collaborative learning program as well as our Master of Contemporary Education program. Many of you will already know Lisa. She is, she is certainly a face and a name um, that is at the end of a lot of our communications. So Lisa, I'll get you to say a, a quick kia ora as well and pop your hands yeah. up so people know. Kia ora, everyone. Who you are. Kia ora, Lisa. And lastly, Bex, the voice that you heard earlier, um, Bex Taylor is our, our project manager within our marketing team who pulls all of these incredible events together and helps to make them happen. So Bex, we'll get you to to give a shout out as well. So Bex, will be, Bex is going to be running our slides and also our chat tonight. So if you've got any questions or any conversations, you can pop them into the chat. But otherwise, um, we will hopefully have a great discussion at the end of this session tonight with our panelists. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping, we will record this session. Um, and so what will happen is we can send this out tomorrow via email with a copy of the slides. Um, it would be wonderful if you could keep yourselves on mute. I'm aware that there's all sorts of things going on as we're now in lockdown, so that would be much appreciated. Um, as I mentioned, the chat functionality, which will likely be at the bottom of your screen, the little speech bubble, bubble. so pop in any questions there. Um, and of course, we love it when people turn on their screens. We love to see people's faces and really to, to inter interact with them and engage with them. So if that's possible, then we'd love you to turn on your videos. So just before we go into Francis's session, I just wanted to kind of set up where we're at with regards to the future of education. So re research by McKinsey Global Institute indicates that all citizens will benefit from having a set of foundational skills that help them to fulfill the following three criteria. And this is no matter what sector they're in or what, what part of your occupation. So to add value beyond what can be done by automated systems and intelligent machines, um, operating in a digital environment, and to continually adapt to new ways of working in your occupations. So the big question that we would love to help answer is, you know, are we teaching these correct school, skills to our students inside of the classrooms today? So what we'll do is we'll kick off with Future of Education from Francis, and then Francis is going to take us through a panel with our amazing panelists. And let's see if we can unpack these three areas. Kia ora, Francis, over to you. And it's wonderful to be here this evening with you all. So thank you for taking the evening or a little bit of time out to talk about education, a topic that is very close to my heart. 
Um, given we've got a time constraints, I am going to move straight into a presentation and, and just share my screen um, to talk through. Yeah. Now, so first of all, I'm, I'm, I won't assume that you are familiar with uh, the Mind Lab. Some of you may have just recently discovered the Mind Lab. So I'll just give you a little bit of a, a, a history. We, are, uh, we developed um, the lab a number of years ago in 2013 to really sort of focus on contemporary education and thinking about what do we need to know so that our teachers and our students can be prepared for the future. And, and so we are looking always across the world at best practice and what does that look like in the classroom, what environments, what types of tools, what types of relationships, what does collaboration look like, etc. And so when we, when we looked at the very beginning at 2013, our focus was actually understanding what young people were doing in, in the classroom. And when we opened officially, uh, first of all, we started in, in Auckland and then we moved across into Rafati, into Wellington and Christchurch. And over time, we actually we taught just under 250,000 young people, which is just a phenomenal number of people in our classrooms and trying to understand how they best learned and understood technology which gave us a, a massive amount of insight to some of the challenges within the education system, uh, which included the, the feedback from teachers about how do they best apply technology in the digital curriculum um, so that they can actually make sure that they are teaching in a way that engages students in the world that they are living. And so when we, when we uh, looked at that, we, we realized that actually um, we had to think about teaching teachers as well. Now, my apologies, I've just had a, a computer freeze, which doesn't exactly help. Excuse me for one second. Okay, so we started teaching teachers uh, very early on and started with a postgraduate program. And actually, to date, over 6,000 teachers have gone through a program with us. So they spend the best part of a year part-time studying within the lab and mostly now online given the new world we operate, but understanding how technology can be taught. And of course, as many of you who are educators in this call will be very aware how we had to transition your own skill set to make sure that it works within this new digital context and remote working and remote teaching. Um, we also have another lab, which is Tech Futures Lab, which is a subsidiary or a, a sort of a sister organization to the Mind Lab, which is focused on more the pointy end of business and actually the technologies that actually are, are taught and utilized and shared and a mainstream part of the business world, which gives us context. So we have a number of uh, education programs across into these areas as well. Between the two organizations, we have 15 different postgraduate programs. Uh, so we are New Zealand's really only specialist graduate school focused on the future in this way. But we don't just operate in a silo. We look across the world to see what best practice looks like. We, we really are interested in seeing some of the complex themes of today, but also going forward into the future. And that could be 10, 20, 50, 100 years time. So making sure that we never take an eye off the ball about where we're heading. And, and that includes education policy um, organizations and think tanks and some of our leading universities around the world who are really dedicated teams to looking at education, the future of work and capability. So I want to start here with the World Economic Forum, who actually have some of the um, some of the most detailed reports about the future, and they look across the globe at best practice. and And this is a very recent report that has just come out in April this year, which is projecting the possible and navigating what's next. And within the education world, this is the way they see it in terms of if you look back um, in time. So you have a horizontal line in the middle, which is the you see twenty twenty one today which is an education, they see that as sort of the virtual reality aspect, the cognitive automation and the distributed platforms, which are the likes of learning platforms, many of you will be using them. It might be LinkedIn Learning, it might be Coursera's, it might be uh, the Khan Academy, whatever it might be. There's actually now uh, a number of platforms which are fulfilling that need of anytime, anywhere type of programs. We're, we understand cognitive uh, processes a lot more, and certainly we're looking at immersive environments around things like virtual reality. But if you go back, you'll see there's been much sort of uh, evolution over time. And we're moving into this next horizon, which is these ambient experiences, which will be a combination of the physical spaces with, with the virtual space. And some of that will be pushed forward because of digital capability, but also the uh, processing capability of computers these days. 
And of course, things like artificial intelligence, many of you have heard the terms, but it's now been utilized far more in education when we start to understand what big data can tell us about how people learn and how people retain information and actually can apply it in their world. And so this is the sort of uh, space that we work and focus in, but we bring it back into the context of a classroom. In the same report, they looked um, on the left-hand side here about some of the areas of, of influence. So within the left-hand tr middle triangle, you'll start to see things like the demand for STEM is increasing, um, micro schools, schools and schools that are focusing on very specific areas around technology, um, the focus on group learning, or here some of this, there's been digital content um, embedded a far, uh, in far greater ways within the curriculum, but also uh, some of the other things that are changing things like the rote memorization and the physical content is declining. And then we move to the right, we start to see some of the other influences that are coming out of this. And these are those three different future scenario planning, which are across um, the possible, probable, and possible again. So in the probable, many of you will be aware of these, lifelong learning has been around for a long time. The gig economy, which is, or the portfolio careers, which are where people choose to work across multiple jobs and careers and not necessarily in one employer at the same time. Um, that the rise of nano degrees and sort of credentialing and micro credential and badges, uh, as opposed to long term um, study, you know, bachelor programs, master's programs, a lot more learning tools. Um, so these these shifts. So there's an activation on one side, and then there's actually what happens on the other side. What is interesting is the innovation on the right hand side is actually more around uh, self-taught and people actually becoming sort of the, the Google student and less around institutions, the traditional institutions. And so we're starting to see new players coming in, which in some cases are the technology companies, it's the Googles of the world or the YouTubes, um, where, you know, where they're actually having students of all ages thinking about learning through a very different lens. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the World Economic Forum, the education framework that they've developed, and we won't spend a lot of time here, but some of these, again, will be very familiar if you're a parent or a teacher in the space, thinking about how do we develop things like global citizen uh, skills so that students understand the context of the greater world and their community and, and how they play a role within the planet or on the planet uh, around innovation and creativity, something that I particularly very supportive of that actually if we foster innovation in students at all ages there is a problem solving uh, process that actually is very empowering to keep learning and doing things differently. The, the actual technologies that we know uh, are really important around digital technologies specifically that we're seeing in the classroom and then there's some of these soft skills around interpersonal and, and being able to you know be think on your feet and communicate well and some of them you'll be very aware of with that high emotional intelligence that people are looking for. So you'll see a range here and of course uh, collaborative learning keeps coming up all the time. How do we collaborate in a classroom so that the the power of knowledge is the collective balance of everyone uh, as opposed to a single point of view that maybe is just purely teacher-led and certainly something that we deploy within our teaching environment. Uh, but the digital world is uh, all consuming and we shouldn't take our eye off how much time young people are now spending online and how much of that time is not just necessarily in social media uh, and playing games, but a lot of it is also for things like research and reading and homework. Now this data here, unfortunately, is a little bit out of date, uh, but it, so it's actually much higher, I suspect, than here. But you start to see the screen use now in tweens is around that sort of four to five hours, depending on which income they're in. And then teens, you're getting into that closer to a typical workday of you know seven to eight hours a day are spent online. And so we have to really think about what are they spending their time online doing? What are they learning? And how much of that is potentially detrimental? Um, we know there's a huge increase in mental health challenges and bullying online and the impact that has. And I think. We all have a responsibility as parents and as teachers to understand that not everything online is good and actually the balance of getting out away from a screen is also incredibly important. So on one hand, we're great advocates for digital technologies and the use of the right tools, but we're also very mindful that it's only if you're using the right tools and you've actually had the balance between the other types of learning that's incredibly important. But again, just to, to highlight this, the sheer number of, of hours a day and what types of things young people are spending their time on. And, um, and many of you will be very familiar with this if you've got young 
family members or you've got students in your classroom, particularly in this teenage group, where there is, they are the highest users of technology between online video, uh, that's mostly around YouTube, messaging apps, social networking, and a multitude of different um, game platforms, whether it be mobile games or the console games. Um, so they're spending a lot of time. Apologies for the long text here, but I think it's really worth starting to look at uh, what happened with COVID. We democratized education and everybody moved online and some of our most uh, highly regarded educational institutes in the world actually put their content online and many are still fully online even today. And so you started to see the types of the Harvards and the Stanfords and some of the most highly reputable uh, graduate schools around the world actually moving into this online space. But when um, YouGov, which is a, a, an organization that crosses all of the OECD countries, looked at classroom teaching, what happened with COVID? What was interesting is across these 1200 teachers, they found there was an increase in teachers feeling or feeling very or extremely confident using education technology. So increased from 50% last year to 66% of teachers of 1200 teachers in multiple countries that felt much more confident about teaching online. So practice does make perfect. Um, but also 77% of them believe that technology will help them be better teachers post pandemic, whenever that might be. And so while it is challenging and there are definitely some great frustrations around online teaching, there is initial uh, feedback that's coming through in research that actually there are benefits in uh, having online learning. Now, one of them that we certainly see is when you are all on screen, like we all are now, it democratizes our, the actual our, our, our differences. So we become more egalitarian. Everybody has the same little square on screens, the same real estate. And that actually is quite useful for a lot of students who find it hard to speak up in a classroom, or perhaps those who sit at the back and don't necessarily feel confident to put their hand up. So there's been some interesting research that's coming out about the democratization of spaces. Then we move into uh, UNICEF, and it is another global organization thinking about what does it mean to be a digital citizen of the world and what do you need? And the foundation skills around numeracy and literacy have, have been there uh, for an awfully long time and continue to be absolutely incredibly important as we go through. But actually, if you start looking at these other skills about from learning to earning, so UNICEF is for those who know is really focused on bringing people out of really challenging situations that they can enable them to be um, thriving individuals. They've identified digital skills in developing digitally literate children and adolescents who can understand technology and search and manage information. Um, also the transferable skills, which is mostly focused on adults and understanding how people and young people can share information, and understand each other. The entrepreneur skills, which is a little bit those innovation types of skills we talked about before, and then some very specific job uh, skills which are around the types of technology you need in jobs and so even organizations like this which are not-for-profit are starting to understand that there's the space of education is really requires now for people to get their head around the digital skills of today and tomorrow so Further on the idea and looking at uh, experiences of online learning, this report has just come out of the British Journal of Education Technology, a very in-depth study. And it looked at the year levels between um, one and 12 around the world and looked at the, this particular one as the perceived benefits of online learning reported by students. And so you'll see the different colors. Unfortunately, this was a black and white graph. So uh, the older students in the black bar what they can see versus some of the younger students. But the big one was the more convenient to review course content was the area where students had the ability to go back. If they didn't understand and comprehend the information, they had a source to go back to. And whether that be because the resources were shared, uh, because they had a recording, uh, because they had a shared document that other students were contributing to during the study. Um, so there was a number of benefits, but you start to see some of these common themes across the year groups. Um, and so also this idea of learning anytime and anywhere. And so the, the ability, if it doesn't quite suit because you've got other things going on that you can potentially um, do at another time. 
Uh, I did laugh at the bottom. The access to courses delivered by famous teachers uh, was particularly important for the youngies. <laughs> so uh, if you're a little bit famous, you might want to be in that category. And this uh, one here, the graph, is actually the perceived obstacles uh, reported by students. So the same year levels. Uh, interesting enough, the big one was the eye strain. So recognizing that actually it's tiring when you're sitting at a screen all day. And I personally have to confess that my eyesight has dropped terribly in the last year. I'm not sure it's age or screen time, but um, I think that you know it's one of the downside. And then of course, we have to look at these ones around technology, things like poor internet connections, and then uh, disengagement at the top because of disturbances. You know, If you're in a family environment, lots of people around, uh, cats and dogs and babies and neighbors uh, can uh, can you know sometimes the the, the environments of can be very detrimental so it's not an easy equalizer if you've got it out of your control and then finally here um, the students expect expected online learning activities what would they like what do they think should happen online so uh, real-time interaction with teachers was far more important with younger students but still very important overall uh, so it's not just about self-paced watching videos and actually uh, doing some independent study. They really do like the interaction with their teachers. And I think if we look at some of the uh, older students, things like intelligent recommendation system for learning resources. So, um, so you know, where do I find more information? What would be the source for that? And um, so there's, there's a number of benefits that we are starting to see. So it's part of our world today, and it's certainly going to be part and increasingly of, of our students' world tomorrow. And by the time we move into another generation, we'll see even further adoption of online learning. So some of the uh, considerations we have to also think about with the young people we're teaching, whether you're teaching 17-year-olds or seven-year-olds, is there is definitely a big shift to the number of careers and jobs that young people will have. And so... Different research says different, has different numbers, but the fundamentally we're talking about somewhere between 10 and 20 different careers or jobs in a lifetime. And that is partially because people will see professional development of changing jobs and opportunities that come up and emerge that they want to step into opportunities that perhaps are not in the role they're in. And so we will see this constant movement. And so differently from perhaps when I grew up, which was a job for life was the ultimate goal, uh, this generation neither want a job for life, but they also want to make sure that they have plenty of new opportunities to do new things around technology. So how do we look uh, to the future and actually understanding? There are many methodologies used when you're starting to imagine what comes next and futures planning is a, a science in its own form. And so you, you look to the past, you look at where the adoption curve is, you, you've really focused on where the investment is, is being um, provided, looking at companies who are investing significantly. And then you look at the trajectory of things like computer processing capability, adoption rates. So one of the things that um, you could look at, for example, until Pokemon Go came out about five years ago, nobody knew what VR was, sorry, they didn't know what AR is. And suddenly overnight, augmented reality, we suddenly figured it out. And 100 million people within a week had downloaded the app and started using it. You know, we often, once we've got the technology, we're quite happy to try new things. And we would all have our experiences of jumping into something that we didn't know before. But as part of the futures planning and looking to around the world, I also look at institutes that are doing things quite differently. And so when you look at the number of schools around the world um, looking at some of the considerations that students are looking for, technology, um, community, environmental issues they want to be part of, project learning, um, they want to be part of a real world scenario. So many schools now are either putting these programs inside the school or they're actually building schools around it, like the Steve's Job School here, which is a school around innovation, uh, Big Picture Learning, which is around design and development of concepts and innovation, a school that calls himself activists. I'm not sure it would sit with everyone well. Um, Brightworks, an extraordinary school around this sort of ex exploration, expression, exposition. And so these are just a very small sample of literally hundreds of schools now who are starting to do things quite differently and, and really mixing up the school system. Even here within Aotearoa, we are starting to see uh, challenges coming in. And, and one example is the Crimson Global Academy. And some of you will be aware of this. This is an online high school. 
uh, and and so you can be a New Zealand student studying fully online in a in a institute here recognised by NZQA, but also they look at their alumni and they start to really talk about things like you know how graduates go to NASA and Google and Goldman Sachs etc. So these are disruptors, but they're the early indicators of changes that are happening in the marketplace. Part of it is the tech revolution. We have such a demand now for capability and, and digital skills across all roles. It doesn't matter if you're a personal trainer and you're, you're following programs and using iPads to, to plan someone's peak performance, or you are a surgeon and you're doing thinking about robo-surgery, you're looking at the data, you're doing analytics on medical outcomes, or you're actually somebody sitting coding. Um, every role has a digital component now, pretty much with the exception of those which are really based in the outdoors. And so if you look today in 2021 on this graph, which has come from Microsoft and LinkedIn data, we currently have 51 million people in the world in these, in these key areas of privacy, trust, uh, cyber, data analytics, cloud, and software development. Now, the, 20, the 51 million today is going to increase by another 149 million by 2025. So in just over three years, fundamentally, we're going to be in this demand where it's going to go from 50 to 190 million jobs in these areas, which gives you an idea. Now, these are also some of the highest paid roles in the world right now. So you, you can't um, blame a young student if they're aspirational one around technology, but also some of the opportunities of global roles working with some very desirable companies that they might want to look at these. So how do we set students up to follow these types of dreams? When we look at um, what employers want from young people, you'll see here very clearly that the, the biggest area of demand, and apologies, I just didn't mean to cover it up, but uh, digital literacy and critical thinking are the two big ones. So digital literacy is the biggest growth area. Uh, employers expect students to have the skill set. And I have to say at the moment, there's still quite a big divide between graduates coming out of many schools having very low levels of digital literacy. Um, I have children between the age of 16 and 24, and uh, it's really only the 16-year-old who I would say is getting a fully comprehensive digital experience at school. Uh, certainly my older children have none at all. In fact, didn't have a laptop even a couple of years ago when they were still in the school system. So they don't have the understanding that perhaps uh, the next generation does. It's a very busy screen, but I just want to, uh, this is a, a from Seek and looking at jobs. Now, if you look in the, in the top corners um, of these boxes where the what is, if you see in the top left, there's a developer role. It, on the day where this was captured a few days back, developer, there were just under 13,000 roles. So this is developers around technology developers. And marketing, you'll see there was just under 4,000 roles, IT, 12,000, online jobs that needed online skills, 5,000 and product, which is around product development, product management, very big field and it's time just under 8,000. So you'll start to see uh, these roles that are really growing in, in demand. When you start looking at more traditional roles on the same day, banking had just 2,000, people in music, just 133, roles in sport, 885, lawyers, 1,131, journalists just 324 and lawyers just over a thousand. So we have to also think about the skills and demand because actually there was a time when you would have thought becoming a journalist is a great idea. So you have 12,000 roles for if you wanna work in IT and development, but only 300 as journalist. So uh, working with young people to understand what roles is very important. The Tertiary Education Commission not long ago, went out and talked to young people about their aspirations for the future. And this group came back um, with us. And so these are children aged seven to 13 years, uh, just over 7,000 young people. Now, what's really fascinating for me in this list of what they want to be, you'll see their sports person is the most popular, uh, no surprises there. But of course, we know that's a very hard path to follow as a professional sports person. But there are um, some new areas which would not have appeared in the list a few years earlier, such as a social media YouTube influencer. Uh, you've got things like a gamer and professional gamer, maybe singing might even be a new one too. Um, NASA and astronauts, as New Zealand is a part of the space race, you know, we do have a space agency. We're only one of 14 countries in the world that does. 
Um, but there are many traditional roles here. And so uh, we have to understand is why do our students still think some of these roles are going to be um, an area where there's opportunity? And some of them, of course, there's very limited opportunity either because the industry has changed or because the roles are so highly uh, competitive. So TUC was just starting to get an understanding of these young group as they were heading into high school about what they might study and what might influence their decisions. The moment we know that um, studying hospitality and tourism are still the most popular subjects at NCEA. Uh, when you look at STEM, at the same group of young people, what is interesting is that there is uh, those who aspire to work in STEM, it's higher for girls in the age group of seven to 13 years than it is for boys. In fact, it's more than double, significantly more. And so this is a really positive shift from my point of view because we've actually had obviously such a huge deficit of young women in STEM, but it does beg to believe what is the issue that why young boys are not thinking in the same way about a STEM career in the future. So um, it's one of the interest areas that I have. The other challenge we have, and this is, often comes as quite a shock. Uh, this is pre-COVID, so this is not COVID related. It's February last year that the Ministry of Education came out and said that only 58% of students in New Zealand attend class 90% of the time. So 42% of students miss at least one day of classes each fortnight. Um, and these, these rates have been dropping since 2015. And so the biggest drop is actually intermediate schools. And so they've dropped from under 74% in 2015 to just 60% uh, in 2020 or 2019. Um, so we're seeing a decline of students wishing or wanting to attend school. And so that is a significant challenge for us. You know, we need to decide, is it a relevance? Is it context? Is it equity or access? Like what is the driver behind that? Because if we lose young people in education at such a young age as intermediate, you know, we may lose them for life. So getting them back into education. I do believe very strongly and across 25 years of being an educator that students don't need answers. You know, we have to give them the ability to find solutions. They problem solve beautifully. They love working together. We need to find ways to facilitate in the classroom. Um, employers hire good people. They don't hire exams. And most people will tell you that there's very few times in your life you'll ever be asked how, you, how, you were, how academic you were at school or your results. Most careers don't require that. They hire on capability and personality. And so we need for people to understand that social development is really important. So you can't do that in the screen. And so how do you get people away from screens enough to make sure that they can develop that collaboration and, and communication skills we need? And so that's coming across in all studies around those importance of soft skills, which many of you would have heard. The other um, process, which uh, I think about a lot in terms of how people approach new information. Now, this is for young people, but it's specifically I see it more in our adult students. The average age of our students across all our programs is 47. So they're mature adults. So there are two types of learners, those that are above the line, which I think of as being open, curious and committed to learning. And those who are below the line, who are closed and committed to being right. Now, unfortunately, if we're committed to being right, that means we are assuming that what we know is the only source of truth. And actually it makes it extraordinarily hard to teach others if we don't understand that information is constantly being updated with better information, better data, better science, et cetera. So how do we move from below the line and be comfortable as a parent or as a teacher to being open and committed to learning? Because actually this is a time in our lives where learning is going to be in, it's such an imperative part if we are going to be successful in the future. So I always look at the juxtaposition of the schools from 100 or so years ago when they actually in New Zealand the average life expectancy 100 years ago was 47 for a man um, so spending time in a school system was shorter and a shorter day shorter period of time for careers that were fixed we still have so many elements that are the same in today's school system and so for me it's about how do we build the confidence of teachers and parents that actually school can be quite different but actually more impactful and actually develop capabilities, problem solving, and actually the richness of a learning experience that's maybe a little bit different than what we've experienced ourselves. 
Some of these are around moving away from subject disciplines into multidisciplinary areas. Some of it's around moving from teaching individuals to collaborating. Some of it's around moving away from prescriptive, like this is how you'll learn, everybody in the class will learn the same thing, to actually much more deliberation and debate within the classroom in different focus areas. So across multiple areas, we see these shifts. And then the flip of how we think about content. So moving away from this idea that actually it's all about information and data and now flipping it so it's all about the transfer of expertise and actually working together and actually so so much of it we can flip around from what we thought because information can be accessed, accessed almost any time of the day and night um, and as long as we can validate the truth and the source of truth then actually there's infinitely you know a, a, the availability of knowledge now is for everyone um, so we have to prepare not us just not only ourselves for the future but also our students and our children and we have to be mindful about where they're heading and the types of jobs um, so we you know it won't happen organically it does take really defined and um, deliberate planning i'm going to very quickly just flick through mindful of time that new zealand itself is changing significantly we have a problem at the moment where we are still not serving multi pacific students nearly to the extent that we should be and actually the percentage of multi pacifics is going to change dramatically over the next 10 to 20 years and by 2040 in, in just you know, really 18 years, one will have 6 million or more people, we'll have a much older population, people over 65 will live a lot, lot longer and most of them will be living well into the 80s and 90s, but also we'll have a, a much larger population Maori Pacific who will be younger than the average age of Pākehā, so we're going to our challenge as a country is our responsibility to serve all our communities and particularly serve uh, the communities where we're not doing well today. And if you look across here in terms of Stats New Zealand and across the world, um, you'll see here in the top box as of today, the percentages of Maori Pacific and Chinese Indian Samoan, et cetera, and then where that populations will shift over the next uh, few years up to 2043. And we need to understand as educators and as parents how important it is to have cultural responsiveness, to understand actually there are many attributes that we can learn from Māori Pacific. We've got a unique standing in the world, um, but actually right now it's our time to, to change things because if we lose students because they feel the system's not supporting them, then we will lose them for good. And so a very big part of what the Mind Lab does is to support our Māori Pacific educators to make sure that they are in a position where they can, in their education communities are very strong. Uh, our growth of population, we're going to see big growth in Auckland, potentially between um, up to two to two and a half million people in the next 20 years. So we'll become a much bigger city and we need to be thinking about the opportunities that will come with that. Um, and we're going to live a lot longer. So if you were born in 1971, you should expect on an average to live to 90 years. If you've got students who are born in 2010, they'll live a little bit long at 93, but there's going to be a lot more people living to over 100. And so multiple jobs, multiple careers, multiple times back at school and learning and, and, and really committing to learning is going to be a big part. Because if you're thinking you'll retire at 65, the chances are um, there's going to be a lot of living between 65 and say 90, uh, where you want to stay relevant and, and maybe gainfully employed. The New Zealand Digital Skills Forum um, has put in this fantastic report, which really identifies a huge number of gaps and opportunity in New Zealand. But the, the, the two key factors are the lack of digital skills among the existing workforce and the scarcity of experienced professionals. And so these areas continue. And right now we have a crisis with closed borders around the lack of digital skills. And so it holds us back. We've got very low productivity um, because of it. It's the lowest it's been uh, for many years, and actually our highest productivity in New Zealand was in 1976. And so we haven't adopted the technical skills that we need. So just to finish, um, before we move into a panel of questions, um, I just want to say that you know, we, we're all part of this. This education uh, evolution is our role as parents, as teachers, as part of the community's grandparents. Our whānau uh, you know, are reliant on us making good decisions about what their future might look like. And it won't look like what we experienced. It's a very different world they're going into. They've got much bigger concerns. There is no off switch for a young person looking at the world through the lens of environmental issues, through the challenges they see around fairness and equity. 
there are so many things that are, are bubbling away behind the scenes that we need to support them on as we work through the next 10, 100 years um, as the world is changing around us. So I'll just finish formally there. there. Um, and then we will be jumping into a panel. I'll hand it back to you, Fee. Brilliant. Thank you, Francis. Gosh, my mind. I, you know, many of you will know I've worked at the Mind Lab for six years, but every time I hear Francis talk, I mean, my mind just goes crazy with all of these different stats that are going, you know, coming out and the research that's been done. And I'm sure many of you are in exactly the same position. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to jump into our panel, which Francis is going to facilitate uh, for us. But before we do, I just did want to introduce our panelists here with us this evening. So first up, we have Nick Kennedy. So Nick is the CEO of Flux Federation, a global SaaS business that empowers visionary companies to lead our world to be more social, to be more socially and environmentally sustainable energy future. Nick loves working and partnering with smart people and creating exceptional technology businesses that make a positive difference to our world. Nick's also on the board of the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab. Welcome, Nick. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, V, and thanks for having me. Awesome. We also have Richard Wells. So Richard leads techno the technology department and is currently DP at Arewa College, which became the first BYOD school back in 2011. Richard is the author of A Learner's Paradise, How New Zealand is Reimagining Education, and has been a keynote speaker at a number of events in America, Australia, and New Zealand. A self-confessed lifelong learner, Richard was one of the first students to complete his digital and collaborative learning program with us and is now studying towards his Master of Contemporary Education also with us. Kia ora, Richard. Thank you for joining us. Kia ora, Fee. Kia ora. And then lastly, we have both Lucas and Arlen. So they are both Year 13 students at Dilworth School for Boys. Arlen is a school prefect. He's passionate about psychology and an avid soccer player. And Lucas is Deputy Head Prefect and is interested in politics, music, and video games. They're both very interested in entrepreneurship and innovation. And they've recently completed the Hey Future program with us at the Mind Lab. Kia ora, Lucas and Arlen. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you. Okay. okay, so Francis, I'll pass it back to you to start running through some of the questions with our panel. Thanks, V. And I also just want to acknowledge um, the boys for taking time out tonight from I'm sure computer games and fun online with friends and just to acknowledge I'm, I'm a member of the Dilworth board and it's a great privilege to be part of Dilworth and so in, in a, a community of you know, young learners and it's great to be, have you both here so thank you and also Richard has been uh, an advisor to our organization for a number of years he's taken a small hiatus while he's doing his studies but we're looking forward to having Richard back as an advisor to the Mind Lab. So I'm going to start off just to give the context and I will throw the question to the grown-ups first. Um, so Richard and Nick, I won't, wouldn't mind if you could just give a quick overview of what you think about when you think back to schooling in your early years. So maybe Nick, if you wouldn't mind just starting with that one. What were the yeah, features? Um, I, th I think this is a really interesting question and I did ponder this one um, earlier today to um, try and distill down what, how, how do I really think about my schooling and um, what I boiled it down to is that the primary years, I grew up in a really small town um, and the primary years were um, the things that, that um, fast in my memory are fantastic teachers um, and great community. So th those are the things that I've um, carried through. And then I thought it wasn't the same at secondary school. Um, there were still some great teachers, but not as inspirational and not as, I didn't feel as connected with my teachers at um, secondary school as I did at primary school. And so the focus shifted for me from it being about this community and just a place that I loved being to being more about, um, just existing in a larger system and um, I, it became a lot more about me as an individual instead of me and me as part of a community and so I thought yeah that that's really um, how I would summarize my early education years. Thanks Nick and Richard was it similar for you? Uh, yes I guess so I was in the UK um, in my area in the UK uh, in the 80s when I was at primary school 
we had a sort of bunch of ex hippie boomers um, sort of running running education, and and the kind of the philosophy was kind of self discovery, and uh, and a lot of the, uh, the traditional things actually weren't um, really pushed. So reading was kind of optional. Um, I read my first book at nineteen. How about that? Um, and uh, and like like uh, Nick said, it's. Um, uh, yeah, you, you sort of go through primary school and it's very much about the development of the child and it feels like it's cosy and it's about community and it feel, you feel like you look after and then secondary school you go into a kind of the, the, the uh, sense of content and subjects becoming more important than the development of people so you lose that, that sense of self and that so you go into that factory system so pretty much similar I mean what drives me to talk about education and write about education a lot is that my, I have a fascination with how it doesn't change and how in 1995, when I was in year 13, I would have also had a Star Wars Zoom background if we <laughs> had Zoom. Um, and But also, like, in general, most schools in, in New Zealand, secondary schools, will be running pretty much the same programme that I went through in 95. In, in 1988, my math teacher took me into a computer lab in the UK and, and took me through spreadsheets. Um, and in 1995, I was doing the UK's first um, A level in in computing and IT. So, so it really, uh, from my perspective, it hasn't um, there hasn't been a lot to change. Thanks, Richard. So, actually, I want to put the same question to you, Lucas and Alan, in terms of when you think of your schooling, is it very different than the two views that Nick and Richard shared? So, who wants to go first? Alan, you've got your you're off mute. Do you want to grab, jump in? All right. Um, I think uh, Richard makes a, a very good point about how the content of subjects and the subjects themselves become more important than the actual development of the person uh, that you get from primary school. Um, obviously, Dilworth is a very um, unique situation um, in terms of uh, what can be facilitated outside of school hours due to it being a boarding school. Um, same sex obviously makes it um, a little bit easier to facilitate certain things in and around the school but in terms of just the schooling system itself I think it's um, it, it hasn't changed very much apart from the introduction of a few subjects which have allowed the curriculum to be formulated around the new subjects but as for your your staples um, the the curriculum hasn't changed uh, drastically um, as Richard also touched on, you know, the, the courses and the, this, the uh, curriculum for, for staple subjects hasn't really changed since he's been, um, you know, in his last year of secondary school. So uh, that, that's pretty much how my, my own experience relates to, to Nick and Richard. Which is amazing because, you know, when Richard's talking 1995, it was way before you were born. So... Mm. Just, <laughs> just amazing. So Lucas, what about you? What's your experience? Yeah, I think I, Alan summed it up pretty well, but I also think that um, there have been a couple of introductions of subjects that have been kind of, I'd, I'd call them revolutionary in terms of uh, deal with things like digital tech, for example, I've been taking that for the past four years and it's a um, really unique subject. I haven't really encountered anything like it throughout my other schooling and stuff. And that's been really great to sort of delve into and see how NZQA is trying to change up the education system a little bit by introducing some of those more like fundamentally modern sort of subjects and um, I think uh, Nick mentioned about how she has a more she built relationships with I think it was primary it's primary school compared to secondary school with teachers I think well for me personally and I deal with it at least it's I find it to be the opposite I felt that as I matured and got older I actually decided I built more um, more positive relationships with staff than I did when I was a bit younger, but that might just be me. I thought that as you kind of became more aware of the subjects and stuff, you kind of had more questions to ask, uh, which led to more interaction, but that might just be me and Dilworth. Curious mind. <laughs> right, fantastic. So so Nick and, and um, Richard again, just in terms of what have you seen through your own work or your children uh, that has changed quite a lot since you were at school? Would you like me to start, Francis? Absolutely. Um, honestly, I haven't seen that much that's changed. Um, the one very, very obvious and big difference is 
they uh, now have this device glued to their hand, which has every piece of information ever um, available on it. Um, and so that has affected um, how they find information. Um, and it has also affected how um, they absorb information. And what I find really remarkable is the inability to turn it off. So in terms of the social sense, you know, it, it's 24 seven, it, it doesn't stop. And I, I'm concerned for the generation which is just moving um, kind of mid high school to finishing high school at the moment, who are really the experiment, the experiment generation, I call them. You know, I've worked in tech for a long time and I personally have been responsible for building those apps on those phones and making sure they're highly addictive and making sure that you know, they don't get turned off. Um, and now I'm looking down the barrel of my own children using them. And um, that, that, that's concerning. It's really concerning because I know what's behind it. Um, and I know how good it is. And I don't think our kids know. And I, I think many of us don't quite understand how good it is. Um, so yeah, that, that I think is the big thing, the big difference. Yeah, Nick, I think what's really interesting, you know, you work in the very pointy end of technology. You, you run a software company. Um, you came from a small town. I came from a small town. I was not involved with technology, and yet I'm a technologist. You know, I think we have to also understand that actually young people need a whole of other skills, just like in the case of Nick and I, where you can constantly evolve and adapt. Neither one of us set out to be a technologist. No. But actually, as we get more into our career, we're choosing different pathways. And often, I think there is this expectation with students that they should know early on what they want to do. You know, I'm I, I wish, if anything, we spent more time just talking about philosophy and, and general themes and history and less time on other areas, because I think today, you know, the ability to just keep changing careers, and, you know, we're both examples of that, um, it's, there's no limitations, you know, neither one of us ever set out in this area. So, Richard, what about you? I and mean, what, what have you seen? I mean, you're at the, at the kind of, in the heart of it all with teaching. That you've seen it's different. Um, yeah, again, similar themes. So that there hasn't, as, as what in terms of what you see and what you hear, and and, and um, at schools, nothing much has changed. And it's interesting with what Lucas was saying with digital. Like again, coming from the UK, Tony Blair in '99 introduced Year 11 GCSE IT as compulsory for everyone in the country. So it's again, it's kind of New Zealand context where it's you know two decades behind in terms of introducing digital as a compulsory subject, but. Um, the um and i actually take you up on your point an interesting idea about the girls having more interest these days in, in going into digital and stem subjects i do wonder whether because one thing that also hasn't changed in 95 when i was leaving school you know girls outperformed boys in in pretty much every area and and that hasn't changed you know girls are outperforming boys across all school subjects in in most parts of the world um and now that stem stuff and digital stuff is now part of the curriculum i do wonder whether boys are getting put off because they know the girls within an academic traditional school system of, of exams and things whether girls are going to always know the girls are going to outperform them in that context and it, it changes the um is the viewpoints towards stem and it and almost makes it more of a possibly more of a female um seem like a female kind of thing because you're going to have more success uh, i think that if, if, there's, if there's been a profound change i think it's been quite subtle i think it's it's in as the internet took off and the kids are far more, you know, as we've said, like three hours, four hours, five hours a day, and they're communicating so um, cons like continuously, I think young kids are much more aware that school's irrelevant um, mm. and will. Um, and so, so where the, even, the, even the students that play the game and go for good grades, they will talk about how irrelevant school is. They're, they're playing a game um, that they'd rather not have to play because they're, they're they're much more aware of what's happening in the world. They're much more aware of the fact that there will be other opportunities. You know, on the list you had, you know, professional gamer and things, and, that, and that's come out of just the information they're finding online. Really, that's not something that schools present. Um, so I think that sense that what we're doing here at school is basically irrelevant has become the uh, quite a profound change. Just an interesting little um, anecdote from last year's lockdown. Uh, we were in week eight of the first lockdown in Auckland and I just for various projects I was working on I spoke to top performing girls uh, they were top performing students they just happened to all be girls in four schools in Auckland 
and we were in week eight and I asked all the girls, um, all in the top one, two percent of their year group. I asked them, OK, so we're in, we've had eight weeks of home detention. Do you want to go back to lessons tomorrow um, where you can see your friends face to face or stay in lockdown? And every single one of them voted for lockdown. Mm. Um, Mm. And, the, and these were the highest achievers. These were the students that, that school were, that could play the game and were winning the school game and, and were getting all the top grades. So if the, if the highest achievers don't want to go to school, um, you do question what, what the others are thinking. So, so I want to just use that uh, to go to sort of segue for Lucas and Alan about areas of interest you have which are not taught at school at all, but you're interested. I mean, there could be things around cryptocurrencies or non-fungible tokens or data or AI. Is there anything either one of you are doing, and it may not be in technology, that it takes up quite a lot of your time, but it's definitely not part of the school curriculum? Um, it's uh, crypto is actually one of my things, funnily enough. I'm in that sort of sphere at the moment. I'm having a lot of fun with it. But um, the one thing that I probably spend heaps of time on that isn't really talked about at school is um, politics and especially political history for me because I'm naturally interested in that. But at least at Dilworth, there aren't really any um, formal ways you can look into that sort of stuff unless you're in a, doing a history assignment that directly looks at that within like a certain context. But I find it really interesting looking through uh, heaps of different stuff like that. So those are probably the two main things for me that I'm doing outside of the curriculum, but I'm putting a lot of time into. Yeah, I think what's interesting what you say is um, it's not been able to personalise subjects and it's certainly not um, skewed towards Dilworth. I mean, that's, often everybody's studying the same book, the, the, the same theory, the same period of history, instead of everybody having the ability to personalise and say, I'm interested in a particular history or a particular country or a particular book, you know, because actually then you don't get the extension of learning, you actually get reinforcement of the same themes. And so some of those really simple things you do wonder, why do we still fall back into everybody studying the same? Um, it's been a, a big curiosity, I think, because you would never do that at work. You wouldn't get everybody doing the same thing. It would be really inefficient. So you'd get multiple people doing different things. So collaborate, you could collaborate at the end and share the learning. So what about you, Alan? Is there anything in particular that you have involvement with? Um, it's not something that isn't taught. I think it's just, yeah, as you say, it's the, the inability to go to a place that you would like to go within a certain subject. So because you can't personalize your own learning, you learn the same fundamentals as everybody else, which kind of, it's, it is a game because it's how much better do you know the fundamentals in comparison to everybody else, which is not really the way it should be because that's not um, like you don't become unique and you don't experience things. You're just sort of going through the motions, going through the system and playing the game, which is, um, yeah, <clears throat> becoming increasingly obvious as I progress through through high school and as I'm starting to come towards the end of high school, looking looking at tertiary education it is just all feels like a bit of a game, which it shouldn't. But wait till you start working, <laughs> <laughs> Lucas. Can I just put it back to you again? Just in terms of what would you, if you had ability to, to even write at the top Ministry of Education and say, look, if you could just do this differently, it would make a huge difference within high school in particular. Is there a few things you could go, yes, this one or two things would make a massive difference to the way you think about schooling? For me, I think that uh, one of the key things would be more freedom in terms of uh, what you actually want to learn, because I'm moving into a um, conjoint degree uh, next year, and part of it's going to be a degree in history. And um, I'm really interested in certain historical contexts. And because of that, I'm allowed to like choose at university what I actually want to study, which is cool. But we don't really have that level of freedom at uh, secondary school, which is understandable in some cases. But I think that if they um, close the gap a bit between university and high school in the sense that you can be a bit more, uh, like have a bit more freedom with learning and that sort of thing. And you can, uh, within certain subjects, you can choose to look at different areas. Uh, within like a certain assignment I think that it would be um, really interesting to see how that would contribute to the way students look at moving from secondary school to university. Lucas why do you think it is that that isn't possible within the school system like why why wouldn't you be able to choose whatever part of history you wanted what what do you think the, the logic is? 
I, I think it's much easier for a teacher to teach and uh, look look around a certain context of history for say say history as a subject, uh, looking at say the Treaty of Waitangi as a um, as an example, writing a report on that compared to saying choose whatever you want. I can understand how that's um, uh, different and how it's much easier to control something like that. But I think that as you come up the year levels, having a bit more freedom because classes naturally get, at least to do with classes, get a bit smaller as um, people specialize into certain subjects, um, having a bit more freedom to do your own thing in terms of whether the assignment allows it. But I know that NCEA um, can be a bit um, rigid with how their assignments are laid out. So that could also be a, a change to make, making NCEA a bit more flexible in terms of um, how the assignments can be run and what the context can be fit in. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I personally and, and, you know, believe that actually because classes are mostly teacher led, it means you do have to teach the same thing. But if you if you blend it around and you make it as a collaborative environment, then actually it's a lot more about the collective as opposed to the individual teacher. And then, but then the assessment system obviously does mean you need to have some uniformity between what everyone's studying so that you can measure one against the other, which is part of the challenge is, is, the, is it working backwards? We're trying to, you know, the tail that wags the dog. And so I think there's some of these complexities about education now because it's not how it's replicated in the workforce. You know, that actually, you know, we want self-starters, we want people can be motivated to go off and do their own things and be independent learners and, and explore and investigate and experiment. So how do, how do we encourage that if we are, are literally saying this is the topic and everybody shall do the topic and therefore everyone will be assessed on the topic? It feels like a real disconnect between that and I think and the real world, whether it be further study or going into employment or studying your own thing. And so I think that's part of the challenge. Alan, have you got any other views around what what you'd love to change within the school system? Um, oh, I, in terms of intellectual property, um, I think uh, it's it's very rigid, which is true. Um, student-led learning, I understand, is very is something that's quite difficult to try and factor in, um, and it's in a in an environment that uses um, comparison to give the discrepancy between those who do well at school and those who don't do well at school. Um, but I've always sort of thought that um, development of people, which we have touched on earlier, is something that's still really important because. Uh, not to take this the wrong way, but I've always been told like you can teach monkeys to do anything, right? So like as long as you have the right attitude or you want to go out and you know, you're know you hungry, you're prolific, you want to do um, this and you have the right attitude to get there, it doesn't really matter what happened at school because as you said, employers don't hire exam scores. They hire people that have the right mindset and the right attitude towards what they're doing. And there's just not really a lot of that at school because there's so much emphasis on, oh, you have to do this to do well to get to this part, which then can, you know, good marks, good education, you do well at uni, you get a good job, high paid, all that sort of stuff. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, it, it's a hard cycle to break. It's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's really, really interesting. I want to put a question to all of you and any one of you want to answer this. How much of the problem are parents? Hmm. Parents wanting to replicate what schooling was like for them. Uh, Anyone yeah, it's, brave? It's, Thank you, Richard. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, as somebody who's experienced some of that recently, it's, um, it, it is an issue. Um, it's an issue where the ones who were successful at the game, um, it's more about the fact that because they know how to play the game and, and, and do well at school, they know how to um, take their own teach uh, their own um, kids through it, so they know how to win that game on behalf of their kids, and so they want the system to stay the same because then they they know how to win that game. If the if the system changes, they don't know how to win that new game. So so they so the the more, the more successful um, parents tend to drive that conversation. They also tend to be the ones most interested in, in being involved in the conversation. So you tend to get more emails from them and, and then pushing for a, a, for a lack of change. Um, they're hugely centered just around maths. They don't really care about anything else. Um, yeah, they seem to just email, you know, we have a, a number of 
20 or 30 complaints um, when we did something recently at my school and and um and nothing got mentioned except for math so it was interesting um, i was just gonna i just wanted to mention something about the the ncaa and personalization or the the, the stuff that there and one thing that lucas and and Arlen might not be aware of is how much schools and teachers in new zealand simply as it were disobey the rules that they've been given um the new zealand system for the curriculum and, and how nca is actually designed for assessment is actually all about personalization and demands that you bring your own interest into schools the teachers just don't like to tell you about it um, i showed the six a summary of the six teaching standards the six things that teachers have to do every day um, to a class of kids and one boy said that teachers should be ashamed of themselves if, if that's the standards they're meant to be doing so um so there's a lot so so we have an award a globally award-winning system in new zealand it's just the schools um are reluctant to do it and a lot of it's around that loss of power i think bernie mentioned it in the tech in the in the chat it's around that if we if you personalize as nca history is meant to ask you to um, nca history um standards are written in in terms of generically um, explain how a historical event affected a population and they have titles like that and they're written generically on purpose to allow for personalization it's just many history teachers again don't like to mention that um because it's easier to teach one um so i think um i've got my opinion it's okay but, but just um, the, the parents piece it's interesting how many times I'm on a Zoom call at the moment and locked down how many parents are complaining about the maths is not the way they were taught it and they can't teach yeah. their 11 year old how to do maths and as though the system is, is by changing and learning mm. a new approach is actually making it hard for them as a parent to be a teacher, you know, yeah. so we are very resistant to change so not just, you know, it is partially I think the responsibility of parents to understand and I even when I put up the data around for example how many journalist roles there are or how many legal roles there are or banking roles today versus others I will still hear parents saying but my son or daughter is going to become a lawyer because mm. it's what they do and it's what they know and so you know how do we get beyond that because the careers are going to be nothing like the careers of today in 10 years and the way you teach and if you're teaching now at, at 40 how you teach when you're 60 is going to be so fundamentally different. And so the evolution of what you know and how you think is going to keep changing because students will start pick and mixing the way they learn. It won't be a single institute, it'll be multiple, multiple dimensional, it'll be from multiple sources, from different, different people. Uh, credentialing is already changing as we're moving into micro-credentials instead of you know, stackable micro-credentials instead of blocks of learning like bachelor programs. Everything is in, in this evolutionary mode right now. And so it, for me, part of the challenge is getting that mainstream understanding that actually part of the problem is grown-ups getting in the way of young people who, who kind of get it. They understand they've got some better scope of what's going on in the world because they're infinitely connected to the world. They don't get to escape it. Like we, we sort of discovered the world through television and encyclopedias. They live it every day. So um, did anyone else want to comment about parents or perhaps the system that doesn't allow change? I think the parents thing is interesting because I've definitely had my fair share of um, strong suggestions for subject choices, if you know what I mean, that sort of thing. We it's, it's pushed very heavily. I should take this or I should take that. But um, and I think that's the same for a lot of um, a lot of people that it's the, the image that they have for us, which is also under, it's understandable. So. Okay. Yeah, I think it's about I think it's about power and control, isn't it? It's it's about parents and teachers that they both have a sense of knowing knowing where they're at and having control over the situation. I think personalization is a threat to the power dynamic between kids and and teachers and opens up an opportunity for in this you know much faster changing world and um, for kids to show that they in so many areas know more than the adult in the room. So and that, and that's really threatening to to adults. Uh, it comes back to being above the line or below the line. Do you have to be right? If, if, yeah. if, if your control is about having to be right, it's a really hard place to start a new conversation about yeah. change and progress. Yeah. And that, and that requires a whole cultural shift in, in, in the teaching sector around because they, they all still, most of them still believe that they need to be the one that's right in the room and knows mm. the answers. So. so look, just a very timely conversation around online learning. I'd love your views um, as teachers and students and as parents 
about online learning and being an, you know, obviously a forced online right now and how that compares to a face-to-face -face, um, environment and any preference from it, particularly uh, Lucas and Arlen, but also Richard, particularly interested in your from a teaching point of view. If you you would like to comment? Um, I suppose I'll start. <laughs> uh, from a, a student's point of view, as opposed to a teacher or a parent, um, I would say that <clears throat> remote learning or online learning is something that I prefer to face-to-face -face lessons for the sole reason that it allows me to be self-sufficient. So having like, say, so much work set in a, in a certain time frame, it sort of allows um, the ability to uh, be able to look after your own learning as opposed to having um, like the teachers say, okay, by the end of this week, this needs to be done. And rather you can block it and break it up yourself. Um, and minus the distraction of say having your friends or your classmates in the in the same classroom while you're trying to learn um, a certain like concept uh, as part of a learning decision it's it's just easier I mean I understand that there's a lot of room for procrastination and getting distracted and things like that but that comes later on anyway so I don't see why people uh, trying to avoid it or pretending it doesn't exist at high school when it's definitely something that people encounter more often once they leave the secondary education system. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I can, I can repeat. That's all the feedback we've had at my school. Um, students just prefer having the agency to work on what they need to work on. Um, for example, art students just love being able to actually do art for three hours which is kind of how art happens, really. You, you'd be you know, doing art for 45 minutes before you do the Nazis is not how, is not how art normally happens. Um, so uh, so that's, been, that's been our main feedback. Um, and, and I think it's that, that it was an inter interesting story from, I went to a deputy principal conference three weeks ago. And it's really interesting when you go to a teacher's conference because after a morning of listening to talk, um, speakers and then keynotes, um, you get a lot of uh, deputy principals that are absolutely knackered. And I think what's, what's the reason they all, they all duck out at lunchtime and go for a bottle of wine and things is because actually not having agency over your day is, is really tiring. Um, actually, because you, you lose that sense of energy and that sense of purpose that, to, that drives you along. So, so one of the things that's really nice about online learning is that you, you gain back the agency that you lose when you go to school and, and, and that sort of actually gives you a bit more energy to do stuff. Um, yeah, it's interesting how, how teachers really can't cope with the system that they um, put on to kids. They, that, it's, it's exhausting um, when, they, when they have to do it themselves. It's, it's a really interesting, I've heard the same thing many times from teachers um, yeah, from, through the programme. I'm going to ask one more question for all of you, and then we'll leave some time for questions from the floor. But this question, again, if any and all would love to, uh, your views on this. So given we need to progress things forward, we know the world's changing. We know the careers are going to be different. You're going to have multiple careers. Um, the, the, you know, there's so many things right now that would suggest that we need an immediate sh shakeup of the system. What... Who, how will that change happen? If you have a view about, will it be from the top down? Will it be parents? Will it be students mobilizing with their feet? Will it be teachers? What will be the catalyst that will change the system so that, for example, I've heard many times NCQA have talked about things like having exams at any time of the year, once you're ready, you should be able to basically put your hand up and go, I'm ready to be tested, not just at the same time of the year or people progress through the school system, not on an age-based na nature, but actually as a, a natural progression. So you might have different subjects at different levels, depending on how your comprehension is. Or it could be you have some classes taught by specialists online because the teacher, local teacher doesn't have the capacity or capability to do that, having a more blended approach across different ways. These are just some examples that are, are sort of put out there. What will be the catalyst? because we seem to have been in the same place, certainly for the 25 years that I've been in this, working to change education and move it forward. 
I I think that it would probably be more towards the like the industry and education innovator side of things because person my my personal opinion is um if I'm if I have a curriculum put in front of me and they say you need to do this and you'll get your qualifications then I don't really see much choice around that I need to do the curriculum that's in front of me at that time so I, I don't I think students certainly have a voice but I think that like uh, proper change in terms of our education system would probably come from outside the student bodies of schools because those are the people that have gone through it themselves the ones that are out of it and they can look back and reflect on the education they had and they can analyze it and say these are areas we think should be changed and that sort of thing and I think that uh, there's hopefully going to be a lot of innovation when it comes to education from people who have left secondary school and five, 10 years on, they say, we see these changes that could be made and um, these are the ways that we should um, rectify them or we should um, add, add to the system. Maybe Nick, I'll, I'll build on that with you. you. You employ hundreds of people in the technology sector. What do you look for when you hire them? How much of what they studied or how, they, how successful they are is needed for you? Um, I'll be really brutally honest with that. Um, we don't look at what people have studied. Um, we don't look at their marks. We purely um, look at, it starts with their attitude, that's number one, um, because I believe you can learn anything. That, that's just time. Um, but if you have the right attitude, that learning goes really fast. If you don't have a great attitude, then it's hard and difficult for everyone. Um, so that's the thing that we really look for is attitude first and everything else can come along um, later. But this, I think this is a really interesting question because, um, you know, when we look from a, from a business perspective, which is what I know best, um, what drives change is usually some kind of a burning platform. And I find it very, very interesting that we have a burning platform right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic. In New Zealand, we're definitely in Auckland anyway, still very, very locked down. Um, this is not the first time we've been here. We've been here before, but it was very interesting to watch how um, we didn't take the lessons forward from last time, or not all of them. It was a very quick um, transition back to the old environment, how everything used to be, um, without taking some of the goodness from that um, remote and online learning and driving it back into the system. And I've got a big question around why that happened. Why did we not um, take the goodness and, and um, drive it forward? And I think part of that for me is the circuit breaker wasn't long enough. I think, in, and Michael's on the call here from Arizona, and I think countries where they've been in lockdown for long periods, I have a, a woman I mentor in, uh, in India, and she's been in lockdown for over a year. Everything in her world has changed, every single part of it, because from socialization, from a family, from a teaching her own children to the way she interacts with her staff, the technology they've deployed, everything has changed and none of it's going back. And so I and think- That's really interesting, right? From a New Zealand Inc perspective, because we haven't had to adjust as much, are we going to be left behind? Is the rest of the world moving on at such a pace? And we're sitting here going to the beach saying, aren't we clever? Because we managed to escape that and yet, you know, where does that leave us? I think it's a big question that will, will play out um, over, you know, over coming months and years. Does anyone else have a view in terms of what that circuit breaker might be? What will change the, the passion or the destination that we're currently on? Because the, the frontier at the, at the top is still the same. It hasn't changed. Any, anyone else as a group? Um, I mean, I think going back to the sort of parents and things, I think there's this sort of chicken and egg situation going on between parents and schools. The schools are trying to keep certain parents happy and parents want it certain ways and it's been drawn in circles. I think the ministry that have put together so many good initiatives and so many good curriculum ideas and things, they just need to upskill in facilitating change. They're basically, they've told all the schools to do X, Y, and Z, and it's, it's good stuff um, without telling them or really helping them through that process. And part of that is, is facilitating how you speak to your community. How do you present these new approaches to education to a traditional conservative um, community that so many and, and, and schools, you know, they're busy places and they lack the skills internally to be able to facilitate those conversations with their community around this. Why, why should we make changes and, and what should those changes look like? So, so I think the ministry needs to back its sort of um, all its um, documents up with a kind of a change management 
facilitation around how you speak to your community and how you and your community build the, the, what is the new vision for education. Uh, and I, I, I use one personal story. Um, I've been mentoring a young woman for a number of years through her high school and now through into her tertiary studies. So um, she was a, in a path to do comm science and she really was really interested in software development and getting into computing. And she's Samoan, so she's already in a minority in terms of professionals. There are very few Samoan um, computer developers or software developers. So she went into study at tertiary and she did a year and then she turned around and said, look, I just don't see myself anywhere here. I'm really struggling. She changed campuses and found her tribe and it was going really well and she was loving it. And she had the balance that she looked for. When COVID hit, she was almost at the end of her degree. Her parents said, you're studying the wrong topic, this, the wrong subject, the wrong career, because look at us. We still work, we're still working on the front line. We've got a job every day and you, could, you can't study and convinced you to take up nursing. Um, and it was just, they just didn't have the context to understand that longer term, the choices she was making were actually going to be better for her and her family. But actually in their world, it was about holding a job. You know, I think those big conversations sometimes have just, we just, we don't have the language that really talks about how things have changed in a way that parents can understand. And I think when we're thinking about big shift and, and massive change, we need it to be communicated at all levels and all understandings. Because there's the parents who are just difficult because they want their, their son or daughter to have the same profession, but there's some who just don't even imagine the profession. They don't have the, the ability to even imagine what that might look like or the pathways to get there. So I think we've got some challenges there. Look, I've got a couple of minutes left maybe for maybe three questions. So I'll open it to the floor. If you could just, if you put your hand up on the little icon and just direct it, or well, maybe you don't have the little icon. I have so, got um, two questions that we've already okay. had come through, Francis, if I can throw them to yep, you. Please do. So we had one from um, Augusta right at the very beginning of the chat. So it might be a bit more for you, Francis, from your um, presentation. I read about many innovations in delivering academic education based on later, latest learning from neuroscience, et cetera, such as charter schools in the US, but I haven't seen any innovation with regards to vocational education. Just wondering, is there any initiative around vocational education to make it more future ready? Look, a vocational at tertiary or at higher education is actually in abundance in New Zealand because we are one of the I think actually the only country in the world that the government funds where the student goes. So they can study in a vocational program doing drama or arts or creativity or technology at a private institute and they are funded in the same way as a university. That, that is very unique in this country. And so I think we have a lot of innovation that happens around vocations here. And it's a matter of figuring out which institutes are of quality and can develop and connections to the industry that people are looking to enter. But I think at an earlier age, it's much harder. In the school system, we don't have a lot of variety in terms of vocational pathways, the, the likes you have with the, the, the dual system in many countries in Europe, where at a point in time, you decide whether you are following an academic stream or more of a vocational stream. And I think that's a real oversight because most students have an idea whether they want to have an academic career and the types of areas that are of interest to them and those who are more entrepreneurial or more technology or more into trades um, and I think those pathways at an earlier stage would be quite useful, but we still haven't really explored that as an option in this country, as far as I'm aware. Awesome. And then another question from Neil. Um, is the issue really universities dictating to secondary schools about what is important? So the high schools are locked into preparing these students for outdated content and ways of working. I'll quickly answer that and others may want to jump in. I think there is a lot of challenge around that because they, you require certain subject choices at a certain level to get into certain programs. And so a lot of students who want to follow the natural pathway straight out of high school are determined where they want to go by the subjects they choose. And therefore they may leave behind passion areas and subjects that they absolutely love because it doesn't allow for it within um, the constraints of a program entry. So I do think there's, again, the tail wagging the dog happens quite a lot in the same way that schools are ranked based upon NCA pass levels. Um, there is in the you know, science subjects and often kids told not to go into, say, for example, a science subject if they do not feel that they're going to achieve. And I hear this a lot from the frustration of schools where students are guided into areas that are perhaps less challenging because it, it benefits the school. So I think there's a lot of things like that where you've got a competitive system um, that plays into that. 
Anyone else want to comment on the, the group? Yeah, I definitely agree. It's a problem. Um, it doesn't. It's not. Not it's particular courses that have sp such specific demands on certain things. I think some schools are more schools are looking at things like semesterization of their senior courses so that you can sort of dip in and dip out, do six months of of the physics that you need um, for your for whatever you want to do, and then you can dip out of that and sign that off and move on to other things. So the you know my, my schools are already discussing sort of you know semesters semester courses rather than annual courses. And I think in the same way, schools dropping NCA level one to give more time. Yeah. You know, there's all sorts of things being trialed to, to, to accommodate those sorts of shifts, yeah, which is good. Mm. That actually ties in really well because there's another question that's directed for Richard, um, and it's around that about what you're trying. So, you know, you're part of the sec solution as a leader in secondary school. What have you tried that has worked, or what are you planning on trying maybe for someone that wants a little bit of inspiration? I know we could we could go on about this for hours, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's 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 fascinating as we've tried to make shifts away from sort of the traditional model and there's some fasc fascinating kind of opportunities but challenges um for example when you ask when you start doing project-based things and you ask two two or more teachers to look after a group of students and how ch um, that's great for opportunity and opens up new things that they can do because they're not fixed within their own single subject silo but um but at the same time um teachers aren't used to working with other teachers and um and professionally they, they 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 find a lot of challenges in 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 working with and finding a balance of who of, of where their role is in in a in a team it's funny how teachers you know teamwork is such a you know um collaboration and teamwork is such a key skill and it keeps getting pushed as, a, as something that you have to do and yet teachers um teachers just don't have much experience in it um in secondary school particularly in any school actually um, so it's quite interesting that, that you'd say that teachers were probably the, the last people you'd go to in terms of learning collaboration and teamwork. So, uh, but we've done so. We've, I mean, we've done some project. We're doing some project-based learning now. We know that it's getting a lot of votes. Of uh, it's much more popular um, than some single-subject stuff. Um, so again, part of the challenge is to get more and more teachers on board with that. And um, we've kind of got a voluntary system now where. 30 odd teachers have signed up to be part of that, but um, it's just encouraging the others to pick up, to, to just put their hands up to do something as well. So, um, but um, yeah. Richard, I, I want to just uh, very quickly close with um, a difference between cooperation and collaboration. It's an example we use a lot within the Mind Lab, and I think it's a really useful tool. A lot of people think they collaborate, and so I'll use the example of a dinner party. So, if I said to all of you, come over to my house for a dinner party, bring a plate. The chances are you're going to make the, the the plate or the dinner or the meal that you're most accomplished at, the one that everybody raves about. So you you don't do anything new. You make this something that's very familiar. You bring it over. So we have 100 people sitting around the dinner table. We're eating the thing that uh, you're familiar with. Everybody has a chance to eat, but nobody has actually learned anything new. In collaboration, I'd invite you over to my house for a dinner party, and you'd all bring some ingredients. We'd get there and we'd work out what ingredients we had and what could we make. And we'd all experiment and we'd cook together and we'd create new things we didn't have familiarity with, things that were quite different. And we'd sit around and eat the meal together. We've all learned new skills. We've collaborated. We've actually discovered new, new techniques. And actually we've done the, the, the group knowledge has really informed the dinner as opposed to bringing something we already knew. I think it's really useful. So I'm going to close off uh, here. Thank you so much for your participation. I will hand over to Fee just to do a formal closing, but I do want to acknowledge the, the panelists and your great contributions. So thank you all for your time this evening. And, um, and I really do appreciate you coming along tonight. And the slides will be sent out. Kelda Francis and another just huge, huge thank you to all of our panelists here this evening. I know you've given up your precious time. So thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us and with this group of people here this evening. Um, we're just going to very quickly make you aware if you don't already know, there are three wonderful programs that all wrap up this future of education and where we're trying to take um, our tamariki. So one thing you'll be very familiar with, which we've talked about tonight, is our digital and collaborative learning program that leads into our Master of Contemporary Education. For those of you who are not aware, we've got a little micro credential, and I say little because it's the difference between 15 credits and 60 credits of the DCL program, but also it's 
um, a much shorter course, so it's a 15 week program rather than a 35 week program. Now that launches um, in September, so end of September, we're going to be launching that micro credential. So if you or any of your colleagues may be interested in dipping their toes in uh, life at the Mind Lab and looking at the future of education um, and 21st century pedagogy, then by all means share that with them. And we're just going to close with a karaki. Oh no, sorry, apologies. And if any of those programs are of interest to you, then Lisa Whittington Slater, who we introduced very early on, our outreach manager is always very happy to take phone calls and emails and jump on Zoom calls and do presentations to help you unpack what your challenges might be and which program fits you. So by all means, please reach out to her. Those details are there on the screen and we'll follow up in the email as well. And we're just going to wrap up with a karakia to finish off this evening's Future of Education session. Ka whakaka irehia te tāpū, ki a wātia ai te ara, ki a turaki whakata ai, ki a turaki whakata ai. Hungie, huie, tai kia. Kia ora everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you for joining. Ka kite. Ka kite ano. Ka kite ano. Kia ora guys. Kia ora Michael. Good to see you again. Good to see you Michael. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks. So hi to Debbie for me. Uh, oh, and she says hi as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's sound asleep by now. Um, <laughs> I'll follow up with an email. My chat didn't work here, so um, I exercised listening skills. Wonderful. Take care. See you, everyone. All right. That was a wonderful discussion. So many great questions and great answers from the panelists. Yeah, really good. I see we've still got Jared and Tracy on. So Jared and Tracy, if you've got any questions for us, we're more than happy to stick around and help answer them for you. Just sing out. Or you may be multitasking in the background, getting dinner ready <laughs> after children, perhaps. Yeah, I think it'll be. We've got a curry that we're reheating tonight, so it's going to be nice and easy. No cooking required, just a quick reheat. Awesome. Yeah, I think it might just be. I'll just stop the recording.